Well, hello! It's time for another exciting episode of Pens in Use. This is the show where I talk about the fountain pens and inks that I've been using throughout the week. And in this episode, I'm going to talk a little bit about the paperless thing and uh, some of the electronic products I do like and some that I... Ugh. So, let's dive into it. If videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And, you know, this is a fountain pen channel, but is there an electronic product that you really like? Uh, a productivity product, I better think about how to limit that. Um, are there areas where you just find papers better? Let us know down in the comments. So, let's take a look at the pens. All right, so from left to right, I have my Selector, I call it Mottled Purple and Black. It's a 1940s Dutch pen. I have a Rex pen, 1748. Next to it, a very, 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 very similar Reform 4521. Next to that, I have this uh, Montbon 225. I have a Lamy 2000, Senator President. Uh, Artisan Pens Cigaro, and a Birmingham Pens Model A. As always, I'll be doing my rating samples in this Cognitive Surplus Notebook. So my first pen is this beautiful, and I mean that sincerely, yeah, beautiful celluloid, I don't know, 1940s or so, Selector. I'm just calling it Modeled Purple and Black because I don't have a model number. I think it's beautiful. You know, when you start looking closely, maybe you see a little bit of not quite perfect alignment in the stamping on the nib, or on the, that's not a nib, <laughs> clip. But overall, pretty good. You know, the ebonite is a little faded, but, you know, what's your ebonite going to look like when you're that old? The nib is a beautiful vintage gold nib. There's a story about uh, the Danish Penol Company where they uh, were actually getting people to send in their gold during uh, the Nazi occupation so they could get enough gold to make their nibs. I don't know if that's the story with this one, but uh, this is also just a generic nib. It's not a, it's not a, a selector nib or anything special, except it is special. Helps if I touch the paper. So, Selector modeled purple and black. And the ink in it is Diamine Damson, which is just a really nice dusky purple. I like it. And we'll do a little swatch here. We had some discussion on swatches last week, so the uh, winner seemed to be this one. But wouldn't you, I would argue that that is some very nice writing from a warranted nib, which is basically like the Yovo of today. You know, a lot of pens came with warranted nibs. Actually, I'd say it's even more generic than Yovo. But then again, back then, gold nibs were much more common than they are today. My next pen is this lovely Rex Pen 1748. So I'm going to let this one shine for a minute, and then I'll compare it to the other, to the uh, Reform. But I'll just point out a little more decoration on the clip. Nice segmented ink windows. And, you know, when we're talking vintage nibs, one of my favorite, a vintage Bach nib. Bach still exists. They don't make nibs like this anymore. Uh, so this ink actually came out of a discussion, as I film this, it's Thursday night, came out of a discussion tonight with somebody who was just asking about uh, switching out, or 
was talking about the sheen on this ink. So this ink is Robert Oster. Fire and Ice. A long time ago, I uh, talked about this ink because uh, I'd heard it had wonderful sheening. Okay, that little blop is going to be a problem for doing this little swatch, but we'll get through it. Um, I have never, even on Tomoe River paper, I've never seen much sheen on it. And this is a pretty wet pen. And so I put it in it, you know, thinking, okay, well, maybe we'll see some sheen. You know, he was raving about all the sheen he was seeing with it. And I'm just, uh, not really. But uh, I won't mention his name, but let's just say he lives in a southern state. So we'll do a couple of those to see if we get to see enough sheen to really matter. And I'll let it dry while I do the next pen. And then after we look at the sheen, actually maybe we'll look at the two pens together and then we'll look at the sheen. This is a review I filmed this week. The, uh, or, well, I filmed the talking part. I filmed the actual writing sample a while ago. So this is a Reform uh, 4521 with a nice gold Reform nib, which doesn't mean it's made by Reform. Although back then more companies did make their own nibs. Uh, when I did, uh, I just gave it the wrong name. When I did originally film this, I, I hadn't quite discovered that it had a sweet spot. Once I discovered that, this pen just opened up the world to me. See, right now, this is wonderful writing. And I think it's making this ink look good. And one of my plans once school's out is I want to talk about this ink and some related inks. Which uh, will be a pleasure for some. It will be excruciating for others. So, you know, I don't watch every video of every person that I subscribe to. I pick and choose. So if it's not for you, you may not want to watch that one. Well, I don't want to watch pins in use. Okay, watch something else. I do first impressions, I do book reviews, and uh, I also do regular reviews where I get, go more in depth with pens. And occasionally I do boring driving videos, which is another thing I'm looking forward to doing again this summer. Maybe being a little too optimistic, but I'm hoping that this coming summer is... I don't know, my mind was not there this past summer. I'm hoping it's more there and I'm more back to normal this summer. So I'm back to doing some of the things I used to do. Because I didn't travel last summer, so then I was just like, Oh, I don't really want to even do a driving video, even though I had lots of driving footage I could use. So, whatever. Okay, so to compare the two pens, then I'll go back and we'll check out Sheen. So I've got the Rex pen on the bottom. I have the uh, Reform above it. Rex pen has a little bit wider clip, but they are seriously the same length. Trim rings are the same. I know it's out of focus, but I can't move my hand to put it in focus, so you're going to have to live with it. Finials, caps are attached the same. Everything is the same. Uncap these bad boys. Or girls. We don't want to be sexist. Now I can do it. Same kind of segmented ink windows. Again, the reform is on top. Okay, the nibs are different. Sections are the same. Feeds are... Are they the same? Yeah, I think they're the same. So I, just for giggles and snorts, I'm going to put the Rex Pen one on the reform. And it fits. Let's see if the reform fits on the Rex Pen. It fits. Interesting. So my guess is, even though the Rex pen was made behind the Iron Curtain, and the uh, Reform was made on the other side of the Iron Curtain, I think there was some cooperation, especially because that Rex pen has a, what would have been then, a West German Bach nib. So... There is more cooperation across the border than some people think. 
Okay, so looking at the sheen. Meh. Meh. Yeah, I'm not seeing any. You know, it could be this paper's a little too absorbent. Okay, I just see a tiny blip of sheen right there at the top. Yeah. I mean, it's a pretty color, just no sheen. Oh, and in response to one of the comments, before I leave this reform behind, uh, I had some questions about the world-famous Pierre Gustafson test now that it's sat, and it has sat for a, quite a while. So, now it passes that test with flying colors, whereas it was not before. Alrighty. My next pen is going to be my daily writer this coming, well, for Friday. and Because, yeah, I don't film this on Friday, usually. Uh, for Friday and all of next week, till the end of school, unless it runs empty. This is my Mobile 225. Why is it going to be my daily writer? Because the Mont Blanc 32 that I thought would last forever because it was an extra fine nib actually ran out because I did a bunch of writing with it. So I just figured, you know what? I could ink up a ninth pen, but I'm trying to not have as many pens inked because the behind-the-scenes pens that I am writing with... Ooh, that's a thought too. I could use one of the behind-the-scenes pens that has a fine nib that has the Parker Quink washable blue in it. It's my daily writer. But anyway, I've got several pens from behind the scenes that I haven't that haven't popped out to play yet that you know I can't show you. Like here's a little beauty I picked up. It hasn't actually I haven't actually filmed the video yet because it's sitting over here on my to be reviewed. Or since I'm chatting. ODE and I did a little trade. He's the Portuguese pen reviewer. So I traded some that I was bored with and he traded some he was bored with. So I have this interesting Lamy I am very eager to ink up. And hopefully I'm doing that this weekend. And I have... I don't remember what that is. It's not related to this pen because... Well, you'll see. So this is not a Lamy pen. It's a Senator. And not only is it a Senator. Oh, that's a slip cap. <laughs> it has a hooded nib like a Parker 51. So, yeah, the German. Let's not just yell at the Chinese because they used the Parker 51 design. Let's yell at the Germans. Oh, we won't do that. And I better shut up there before I get myself in trouble. But yeah, I've got some interesting pens over here to hiding. I, I need to batch film another few reviews. All right, so oh, I never wrote with this pen. Let, let's actually write with it. I mean, that's one of the reasons you're here. So this is a Parker. No, wow, Mont Blanc 225. Um, this is one of their student pens. You know, they don't really have a student pen line anymore. They've decided to focus on the luxury end, which I think is a shame because they made some really, really nice student pens, especially if you can get some of their Monte Rosa line, which was really, truly meant for students. I'm sorry, this is an extra fine nib. Uh, the ink in it is Waterman Absolute Brown. Um, a pen pal recently sent me a, a sample of uh, SBRE Brown from Ackerman. So I'm curious to try that. I Probably when this runs out, I will try it. You know, samples are kind of nice because, you know, a whole bottle of... You know, this is a sample also. You know, when you have a whole bottle of an ink you hate, like uh, La Folia Noir... You feel bad just chucking it down the sink. So then you end up hate using it just so you can use it up. But uh, samples, you know, you, you dump a milliliter of ink down the sink. You can justify it to yourself saying, well, I can't get my nib into it to load it in a pen anyway. On a fun note, I can't remember if I showed this last week, but the same pen pal I thought had sent me a bottle of Ackerman ink. But no, 
thankfully, <laughs> is it bad that I'm thankful? Sent me just a empty bottle. It's kind of cool. I mean, it's a marble that holds the seal so you keep ink at the top. So, I'm sure these inks, these ink well, or yeah, these ink bottles cost more to make than, say, a standard Schaefer bottle, but they're cool. <laughs> My next ink, pen, thing, I inked up last week. Uh, I gave away a bunch, uh, some awards this week, so I uh, filled them out with this pen. This is my Lummi 2000, one of two that I own. This is the broad nib one. So Lamy 2000, I'm writing at a little bit of an awkward angle here. It has a broad nib. The ink in it is Waterman. Another sample. Tender Purple. Oops, almost did my old swatch. It's okay. It's okay. We'll make it work. This swatch definitely shows up the stubby. <gasps> Almost dropped it. <laughs> uh, um, what was I going to say? Shows off the stubby nature of the nib. So last week, I had already filmed this. It was uploading. And ODE had a video scheduled, and uh, so I was watching his video while all this was going on, and he mentioned how he really doesn't like Pelican, no, sorry, he doesn't like Waterman Harmonious Green. And I just like, and he just finished raving about this specific pen model. I just thought, whoops, because what's in here? So it's a Senator President with a gold nib. I wish Senators still made pens like this. I think last week I did the link. Uh, he talked about uh, how this one compares to the Mobile 149. I've never touched a 149. I've seen them in a display case, but... You know... Even if I use my YouTube money on it, uh, that's kind of not very high on my list of pens I want. So, But anyway, the ink in this is Waterman Harmonious Green. And maybe it's the pen. Because inks take on a different character depending on what pen they're in. But I think it looks really good. I mean, really, really good. Oh, I just did the wrong swatch. That's okay. I've got room. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. You're not a failure. What is it? That old Saturday Night Live skit where... I'm trying to remember the actor's name. He would slap himself on the forehead over and over and go, Stupid, 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 stupid. I can't remember anymore what that was. My parents were not Saturday Night Live watchers, but I would occasionally sneak an episode. And, uh, now I'm not a night person anymore. I used to be. <laughs> so, that ship has sailed. But I, I still catch it on clips and things. Alright, so we'll just have a big awkward blank spot. Uh, <laughs> um, Artisan Pen Cigaro, made by JPL of Australia who has now moved on to doing videos on machining and stuff. So that's been interesting. So Artisan Pens. Cigaro. Uh, this is has a broad Asian nib. B.A. Bad, bad apples is what that stands for. Uh, the ink in it is Waterman. 
Serenity Blue. So, um, I can't remember if Asian is supposed to mean it's like an architect's nib or what the heck that's supposed to mean. But, you know, I'm not seeing it really. You know, if it was an architect's nib, the downstrokes would be wider than the cross strokes. And... I don't know, maybe if I use my imagination I see it, but I really don't see it. And my last pen comes from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Oops, and it'd be nice if I hold it on screen. <laughs> this is the Birmingham Pens Model A. I just saw they have a Birmingham Pens uh, Darth Vader, which looks very similar, but apparently has a clip. But I'm not in a hurry to buy any pens right now. And, you know, I've got a black pen, so why do I need another one? Unless it's a, one of those slim back vintage pens. Birmingham. And I do kind of like this ink that's in it. Uh, this is just a sample. In fact, out of everything you've seen here, all the Waterman inks are samples and... Uh, is there any other sample? Oh, this one. This one and all the Watermans are samples. Oh, sorry, I forgot the name of the nib. So this is a double broad nib. Uh, the ink in it is Indian. Not India ink. That's bad to put in a fountain pen. This is, oops, Krishna. Specialty Sunburst. And I suppose if you're going to have a sunburst, it would be kind of a specialty. So nice, bright, happy yellow. Um, I've tried their Canacona, which is a gorgeous color. Um, till it grew crust all over the nib. This doesn't seem to have that problem, although it could be the pen. But if you have crusting inks, they're usually in the yellow or orange family. So those are the pens and inks that I've been using this week. So those are the pens and inks I've been using this week. I uh, was surprised that my Mont Blanc 32 ran out of black ink with just a few days left of school. And I was going to fill up a new pen with black ink. And then I just said, heck with it. I'm using a fun color. So my daily writer pen is going to be that uh, Mont Blanc with, uh, what is it, 225 with the brown ink. And I'm just going to say, close enough to black. So over this past year, I, I started an experiment and then the uh, whole COVID-19 shutdown kind of accelerated it. Um, hard to believe when you look at my background and, and if you saw the mess that's on my couch right now and the mess that's on my coffee table, I aspire to clean surfaces, everything in its place, everything put away and you know fewer possessions. Clearly, I don't succeed. If you can even see my nicely organized hmm, bookshelves, you know, like the one you see here when you see the side view of me, um, not so much. I just, uh, I can't reach my ideal. But one of the things I thought would be nice is what if I went paperless for a lot of things? You know, a fountain pen guy, I'm not going to go totally paperless, of course. But, so I experimented with some things. So through this last year, I experimented with using an electronic calendar. And, uh, and I picked it up kind of in the middle, like right after Christmas last year. <laughs> and then the pandemic hit. But I thought, okay, we'll experiment with an electronic calendar. Hey, the calendar is in my pocket all the time if I want, Right? Well, in practice, not exactly, because what a, sorry, I'm going to swear here, 
but who cares? That's how I feel. What a pain in the ass to enter things into the calendar on this flipping thing. And I found a nice program for the calendar. It's a Moleskina's program. I like it better than iCalendar. And it connects to all my different calendars because I've got a work calendar too. Um, yeah, I, I, I experimented with Google Calendar. And uh, yeah, okay, they'll give you reminders, but I don't carry it in my pocket so I don't get the reminders. So yeah, it just was not doing it for me. I tried an electronic to-do list. Uh, first, I tried Microsoft's to-do because I have it free through my work account. Um, didn't really like it. Then I tried, I, I really, really tried hard to get into Todoist, which is another program that does the same thing. And I know to-do lists maybe aren't the best thing for productivity. You're supposed to time block and all that, but, you know, there's just things, if I don't write them down, I'm going to forget, like, grade Wajimahuzi's test because they were absent. You know, i got to write that down or I'll forget. Um, so, yeah, I, I need a to-do list of some sort. Yeah, the electronic to-do list was kind of nice. I could add stuff as I thought of it. And I actually very almost never touched it on here. Uh, basically, I touched it on my personal computer and my home computer. Or not personal computer. My work computer and my personal computer. There we go. Uh, but, again, not as accessible unless I'm sitting in front of my computer. So I didn't care for that. Uh, I have mentioned, I, I keep talking about how I want to do this series on productivity, even though maybe, hey, practice what you preach, dude. Um, but, you know, thinking about productivity, I was thinking, okay, I should do, uh, well, I was carrying a pocket notebook with me everywhere, which I, I do to a certain extent still. But why was I carrying a pocket notebook? Because originally I tried an app on here called, now I don't remember, Excuse me. I don't remember what it was called. It was designed to take brief voice memos and transcribe them to text. I think I took like five. So, got rid of that one. And the little pocket notebook worked much better. Um, and, and I've talked on here before about using e-readers versus uh, books. I do find e-readers nice for a few things. They're more portable. So if I travel, awesome. Another nice thing with an e-reader is they take up less space. A really awesome one is if I read at night, like before I go to bed, but I'm sitting in bed and like in that half zone, my e-reader has a nice night light on it. So uh, I really like those features. But I like physical books. I mean, I've got uh, a copy of Daniel's, or sorry, not Daniel. Dan Simmons' Carrion Comfort that I'm reading right now. And yeah, last night I read a little bit on the of using the Nook app, but mostly on a computer or on the book actually. Uh, as far as taking notes at work, I have found because I I have notes for various kinds of notebooks. You know, I've got different committees I'm on, different kinds of things going on. I have found it kind of convenient to put my notes, like all the faculty meetings in one electronic notebook, all my uh, school leadership meetings in another faculty notebook, all my school handbook meetings in one, school technology meetings, and, you know, the list goes on. I have found that kind of handy, and I like, I, I kind of like e-ink. It's not as nice as paper or fountain pens, but it has some advantages, like you can rearrange pages. It can take your handwriting, even my handwriting, and convert it to text. So those have been handy things. And rather than, oh shoot, I grabbed the wrong notebook kind of deal, I have it all on one device. So I've actually liked that for work. That has been handy. I will concede that. But here at home, uh, for all my book reviews, you've probably seen me... Oh, it's over there. But anyway, I've been waving a notebook around as I talk. Why? Because I write everything in a notebook. Uh, I, I come up with ideas during the day. One of the things while I'm teaching, I have a desk pad. Uh, I've shown it to you. 
Uh, I did a video review of this uh, uh, Baron Fig deal that just has you... Uh, it's just awesome. It sits, I don't really have a desk, but it sits beside my computer, and I just write things down as I think of them. Uh, at home, not so much. I use other things at home, like a smaller thing that actually fits on my desk. But, you know, the, the important thing is, I, I found myself using more paper. And uh, this year, uh, subscription to, what was it? One of my electronic products subs uh, was about to expire, and I just thought... Ah. And what did I do previously? Well, there was a time in my life when I just hoped I'd remember everything and I'd write notes on random pieces of paper, and that works about as well as you expect, especially as you get older. So I went back to what I used to do. So I think they're sold under a new name now. Am I holding it right? Yeah. A Midori Traveler's Notebook. I, I don't know what they're called now, but... You know, in the front, because I have three notebooks in it, in the front I have, ooh, it's actually almost full, a nice little notebook of really thin blank paper where I just write down random things as they come to me. That is really kind of my pocket notebook. Then I have a monthly calendar. I'll just show you a blank month. Then, and, oh, and I have a dentist appointment that, coming up, so uh, I wrote that down. Um, oh, never mind. Okay, so I was going to say, what about stuff that's outside this that I can schedule like a year in advance on the electronic? That's what the blank pages in the back are for. Hey, if Mom, Pa, Squirrel, and I decide COVID has gone away enough for next summer, and we decide next summer, w w Squirrel, you come home uh, July 4th through 10th, and we'll come out there August 14th through 19th. I can write it down. And I totally made up those dates, so don't come break into my house next summer at that time, because I might be here and surprise you. And, and I may look like a nerd, but I can fight back. And then the last set notebook is a grid notebook. I don't want to show anything personal, so I'll just show you blank pages. Uh, and what I do there is it's basically a simplified bullet journal. Uh, every month I make a list of all the days of the month, and I write down the major events of that day. And then for each day, I write down a to-do list and I cross things off as I do them. No electronics needed. And this goes everywhere with me. It sits in my bag when I'm going back and forth from work. When I'm at work, it sits right by that barren fig tablet thingy. When I'm at home, it sits beside me on the couch. It's handy. If I go to a meeting, yeah, I'll take my digital e-ink tablet thingy. Uh, but I will also take this with me. So, uh, yeah, this, this is great. And it honestly kind of replaced that uh, pocket notebook. So, uh, yeah, the pocket notebook's handy if I'm traveling or something. But even then, this usually goes with me. Maybe not on a hike, but... Okay, maybe on a hike the pocket notebook would be handy. Maybe. <laughs> but, anywho, uh, the moral story is... A lot of electronic products just... I lost interest. Now, uh, one electronic product that I like and I've continued to use is a program called Evernote. And I'll be honest, I started using it before I got into this whole productivity thing and trying to go paperless. Uh, Evernote, for one thing, is an awesome scrapbook. If I see a recipe that's interesting, bam, I put it on Evernote. If I read an article or see an article and just want to read it later, Bam, I put it on Evernote. In fact, uh, the two articles that are linked below, no, one's a YouTube video. Okay, so the one article that's linked below was actually one that I bookmarked on Evernote. I, uh, and I love the search feature. You know, I, I can, you know, if I say, okay, what was that article I, I collected on transgender people in Croatia? I can type transgender Croatia in the search bar on Evernote and it, boop, finds it. It even, I was really impressed with this one night. I was uh, trying to find a certain pen and it, it found it because I all my notes for these videos are on Evernote along with photographs. And that the photographs play into the story because it found the word for the name of the pen on the photograph of the pen that was in the note. 
that was the first link that came up was to the photograph. How cool is that? So I really like Evernote for storing lots and lots of information. Could I be more efficient with my tagging and so on and my arrangement of notebooks? Yeah. Um, I, I definitely, Carl Pauline would not approve of my arrangement. But you know what? It works for me. For one thing, is an awesome filing cabinet where you can find stuff. What was it? 14 or 15 years ago, I moved here. Not to this house, but to this town and the school. And I had been at two other schools before that. And one of the schools, I, I started filing away oh, lab ideas and articles on different topics. And had them in the filing cabinet. I had a whole system. In fact, I... No, I don't think I have the book anymore. I used to have a whole book on having a system for organizing your files and putting codes on each file and uh, having a master file that explains what each code is. And uh, for one thing, moving between two different schools, a lot of paper to move. The other thing was, Sometimes, because I'd be like, oh gosh, I don't want to deal with the coding. Then I would end up with a backlog of papers to file. And then I wouldn't want to do it. So Evernote really is taking care of all that. So, uh, so th yeah, the other article I have there is about a file cabinet. Now, yeah, I have a few files, a few things I keep on file. But for the most part, I have found having it electronically is better. Same thing with my tests and so on, or different things that I hand out. It's a lot easier to save it having an organized file structure on my computer rather than saving a hard copy from year to year of everything. Um, no, I don't need a copy of test four from physical science of last year. I'm probably going to rewrite it next year anyway. So uh, now there was a nice lady that I used to teach with who had a whole, would she have two or three filing cabinets full of different worksheets and things that she used but I like them on the computer because I just print a fresh copy off so uh, you know I, I'm not a Luddite I'm not anti-technology I'm just finding it's in its place I found I prefer digital photography over film photography I get instant feedback I'm not afraid to take pictures because like oh do I want to waste the shot on that um, I never would have gotten into sports photography if it weren't for digital, so uh, yeah, not a Luddite. Um, and then sometimes I also think that maybe, I'm not quite sure how to yet, although Evernote with its search system is part of it, maybe the electronic needs to get a little further away from the paper, pencil, analog, you know, trying to be like that maybe be a little bit more independent and come up with something new that plays to the strengths of electronic. And again, search is a good one. It's a lot easier to search through things electronically. Uh, another thing I've discovered is, you know, if I'm working on a project, I like to have stuff spread out in front of me. What a pain flipping back and forth between screens. So, advantage paper. And here's another one I've discovered. So thanks to the lockdown, we, last spring, had to do everything electronically. And so I was teaching, here where I teach, we have, the, our state paid for all schools to have the Microsoft Office suite. Every student has a subscription to Office 365. You know, are there better products out there? I, I'm not going to get into that argument. That That's a side argument. But... Some of the things that were nice, first of all, I don't know exactly what I would have done a few years ago, back when we didn't have all this technology. Um, second of all, Teams, Microsoft Teams, was a nice option for turning in assignments, for me providing videos of labs, because of course they weren't doing them because we were online, um, providing recordings of lectures, me going over solutions to homework, all that kind of thing. Uh, that was awesome. Um, it was nice because I just have instant access to every kid's homework. It was relatively quick to grade. I could comment on it and so on. But I uh, couldn't see some of the flaws because we weren't in person. Uh, one of the flaws I did see that showed up quite quickly is 
kid doesn't do the work, then turns it in later, how do you know? Unless you go back or they tell you. That's a major flaw. So, uh, <clears throat> this year when we went back to school, we didn't know if we'd be online or we'd be in person for very long. So I kept everything electronic. And one of the things I noticed right away is, wow, kids are so much slower when it's electronic. And they waste so much more time. And when they're doing labs, it's really difficult to switch between applications. You know, the one that has the instructions, the one that has the lab data, and maybe they're running another one that's taking data, you know, if they're using electronic sensors or something. Now, yeah, there's strengths to it, like you can pop in graphs right into OneNote. Um, you, can you can have them take photographs or lab at different stages, because, you know, some kids will just say, yeah, we did it, we got that reaction, even though you know full well they didn't, they just fooled around. So, uh, there are advantages to electronic, but slowed down the awkwardness of using the screens. Uh, I have found students pay better attention when they don't have the distraction of electronics in front of them because when they're using OneNote, supposedly to take notes, you gotta not only teach, but you gotta be basically behind them, keeping an eye on their screens to make sure somebody's not playing games. And then, you know, put that game away, and then you turn around, there they have it again. It's just like, okay, self-control here. But, you know, I'm dealing with an immature clientele because I teach high school. They, you know, they're still kids. Uh, they're probably that way as adults, too, because I see the same thing in teacher meetings where they get bored of the speaker, and you know, especially at the big teacher meetings. So they pull out their cell phone, they're playing games on it, or they pull out their laptop and they're doing other stuff, so... You know, I like the idea of saying, all right, let's clear the desks if, as I'm explaining stuff. So all they have on it is their notebook and their writing utensil. So, yeah, I suppose they could still, I'll pretend I'm a kid, have their cell phone down here and be texting. <laughs> you know, they, they can make their faces and stuff. It's, it's not something that goes away as adults. Some of us learn to control it. Some of us don't. Um, I think in when they're students, we have to teach them those skills and one of those skills is you, you, well you just have to say you can function without this in your hands for a for, uh, for a while and uh, yeah I don't see analog going anywhere now technology has its place I like a lot of physics labs a lot better when I can use vernier equipment rather than well, I just think back to when I started teaching trying to do some physics labs with ticker tape that was awful. And you didn't even know they got bad readings until you know, you'd sometimes spend a day or two dealing with these pieces of ticker tape. Oh, yeah, you got a bad run after they've done all this work. So, yeah, there's a lot of advantages to electronic. Uh, sometimes spreadsheets are handy for showing graphs because, yeah, I'll have them do a graph or two by hand, but really, making a graph by hand is is it really the most useful skill? You know, you do a couple, you show them how to curve fit, but uh, then it's time to move on and actually analyze data, because I... Okay. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong, but how often do scientists do a graph by on graph paper by hand, curve fit by hand, fit an equation to it by hand? Now, that's what why we have the tools we have, so... Anyway, I'd love to be corrected if I'm wrong. I, I see value in doing it so they understand how graphs are laid out because kids will just look at graphs and don't pay attention to details like, what's on this axis? What's on this axis? Or what does this line even mean? So, you know, they, they have to do a little by hand to figure that stuff out. But there comes a point, you know, seriously. Um, so, anyway, I, that, that was a long babbly topic. I guess what I was trying to say is I, I'm appreciating more and more where paper has its place. Uh, and I'm also appreciating the strengths of electronic. You know, my big file cabinet that moved between two different schools, well, three if you count this one, uh, is no more. It's all electronic. Another nice thing with electronic is I can quickly share it. Like yearbook, I can take... Okay, yeah, using this, 
but I can photograph, say, the spring concert. So we've got all the kids who participated, what was played, um, any solos that were done, all that information. I just pop that puppy into OneNote, and then whatever kid is doing the music pages, they've got it taken care of. Everything they need is right there. Uh, if, if I have some coaches that will hand me physical rosters of their students that are in like football or basketball or whatever. So, photograph that puppy, snap it into OneNote, my, my yearbook students have access to it. Even if, as has happened, the, the roster is entirely handwritten by pencil on a, the back of a piece of scrap paper. I've got it. So it works well for things like that. And, and I can see it would be hand, handy for working in teams. But at the same time, I do my best thinking on paper. And there, and I have done a video on this. I, I'll have to, if I remember, I'll search it out. But you remember a lot more when you handwrite. So my old system way long ago, where I used to just write things on scraps of paper and stuff them in my pocket and never have to refer to them again. That was that worked until I had too many things to remember because the act of writing put it in my memory. I'll just mention another thing that's handy uh, about Evernote. I do my grocery lists on Evernote as uh, little check boxes. So I just, you know, eggs, milk, spinach, eggplant, you know, just as I go around the store, I can check the stuff off. But what's nice is on the exact same page, I have a link to the recipes I'm making. So basically, I make my grocery list on that Evernote page as I am uh, figuring out my menu for the week, which has saved me a lot of money. Um, May actually have paid for its Evernote subscription over each year. So... Yeah, Evernote is a tool I like. Uh, I don't see myself getting rid of that one. I feel like this is a topic I want to revisit, maybe in more detail. Maybe I should talk about some electronic products and some paper products one of these days. Uh, summer is coming, so I will have time on top of everything else I want to do this summer. So, yeah, we'll see. But anyway, if uh, videos like this interest you, where I talk about fountain pens both new and old and at all price points, I would invite you to subscribe. And have you tried electronic and gone back to paper? Or tried paper and gone electronic? You know, what products do you like for each one?